thank you for inviting me. I also thank you that week nine, you're brave enough uh, to come here and listen to the continuing saga of the Eurozone debt crisis. And the most preeminent example of this crisis, guess what, is Greece. In fact, some of you were here, I think three or four years ago, where a friend of ours, a faculty member who is now one of the leading economists uh, in Germany, and he belongs to the inner circle of the Ministry of uh, Finance, Clemens Fürst. Uh, we had the same Dean seminar here, and unfortunately, we agreed, we we're pessimistic, and we we're justified. Whatever we said at the time, that things didn't look that great, uh, the debt restructuring was not uh, that good, had not occurred, that the austerity wouldn't work. So all of these things that we discussed with Clemens at the time, and both of us, because I know Clemens quite well, uh, we thought that we would be wrong. Uh, unfortunately, we were right. And after three years, basically, we are not in square one, but again, uh, the Eurozone debt crisis as has manifested itself uh, in the case of Greece, uh, it still, uh, still persists. Now, <coughs> uh, what I will try to do first, before I do my introduction, uh, mostly this work is new work that I have done uh, with a former classmate of yours, uh, Yudara Pieris, uh, who is now tenure faculty, prematurely, possibly because of this work. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking, he has done much more than this. Uh, in the International College of Economics and Finance uh, between LSE and the High School of Economics in Moscow. And also he's in the Prime Minister's Office uh, of Sri Lanka, uh, which is the main uh, body of designing economic policy for the Sri Lankan cabinet. Uh, so he's one of you, he has graduated from this, and he's a good example that has excelled both academically, intellectually, as well as in policy making. And I wish him that he will fare better than I fared when I was advising the Greek government. Because from what you are going to see, I was not that successful. Anyway, so let me uh, start. Uh, the debt crisis of the 80s and the 90s, uh, basically, as we know from the literature, uh, were uh, due uh, to external shocks, exchange rate crisis, and profligate fiscal policy as the case uh, primarily was in Latin America and uh, Greece. We have a multitude of crises in the early 80s. Uh, here I have a list of crises, if you see, in all sorts of countries from Slovenia all the way to Ukraine, Uruguay, uh, and they were a negative external uh, environment, there was a productivity slowdown, and it was uh, the commensurate hike in the U.S. interest rates that caused liquidity problems initially that subsequently uh, were translated to solvency problems. And in fact, there's a very, very good paper by Chuhan and uh, Sturzenegger uh, that describes and has a good tabulation, a good taxonomy of this crisis, as well as for the crisis in uh, the 90s, which were debt crises that basically were caused by unsustainable fixed exchange rate regimes, currency boards, primarily in Latin America, large current account deficits, uh, again, budget deficit, profligate fiscal policy, that's the story that more or less appears and reappears in most of the emerging markets, crisis and liability dollarization. So these were basically the crisis, <coughs> these were the crisis, uh, that for the most part uh, were due to exchange rate, weak fiscal policy and external uh, shocks. Now, our focus, the ones who know and uh, are aware of uh, my work, uh, will be on default. The key propagation mechanism and the key thing, if we put something on the table, uh, on the table in this debate, in this intellectual inquiry, is default as uh, is default as an insurance uh, as an insurance concept. In other words, default provides expensive insurance against negative shocks that the government buys to smooth household consumption. 
please, we all know in macro and finance, what's the intertemporal optimization problem of governments to smooth consumption over time and to lower the volatility of consumption and therefore default in the presence of uh, bad shocks and frictions and uh, market incompleteness and market incompleteness is used to smooth uh, this uh, cycle. So the main thing is default is something endogenous, default is not a catastrophe, default happens in equilibrium and default has economic, real economic consequences and is not just a monetary and nominal phenomenon. And therefore, most of my work all these years has been uh, around, uh, gravitates on the importance and the causes of default. So, uh, the, and the literature nowadays in macro and finance, in the old times default was mostly game theoretic or if you will, a, a strategic market games kind of concept or a contract theoretic, the Hart and Moore literature and before Hart and Moore it was Shubik and Wilson, Shapley and Shubik and uh, the rest of the people. But now uh, uh, default, particularly after the global financial crisis, uh, has been incorporated and embedded into the mainstream uh, orthodox uh, macro, macro finance models. And here I have, you know, some sort of a little, not exhaustive by no means, literature of how default is embedded in standard macroeconomic models. Uh, and the main points, uh, the main point I want to make is this, in the presence of frictions and missing financial markets, default operates to smooth consumption across time and across stage of nature, given that agents are risk averse and they are they want to smooth consumption across time and across future scenario and future resolution of uncertainty. Default is like an insurance contract that tries to smooth this consumption across time. And thereby, governments, that we assume that they are benevolent, well, that's a big assumption. And the more we enter the 21st century, the less I believe in it. But nevertheless, the standard assumption is government borrows to smooth private consumption and ensure against ba uh, bad shocks, in other words, to protect the weak uh, and the meager uh, incomes and household uh, outcomes uh, in the economy. Now, I want to link now as the title of this kind of exercise, because that's an exercise which is not just one paper, I want to link private debt and sovereign default. Uh, let's uh, see some stylized facts where we see how the private debt to GDP ratio has evolved over time. Now, and I'm using basically the usual suspects. I would not call them pigs because I'm one of them, so you know, I have a higher self-respect than calling myself a pig. But it was the Southern European countries uh, that suffered during the Euro Eurozone de debt crisis, namely Greece, Italy, and you see how from 2001, the rate of increase of private debt. Please observe, because I'll be talking about Greece extensively, that the private debt in Greece was not that big. And in fact, the ones who remember four years ago that I laid the blame primarily of the mismanagement of the impending crisis. It was a crisis that could have been averted. If you compare and contrast what was happening in, let's say, uh, Portugal or uh, Spain or Cyprus for that matter, uh, or Ireland, Greece was not that bad at all when you have a, a private, uh, private debt 100% of your GDP, is not that uh, catastrophic. However, for factors that I've talked and I've written extensively, uh, this uh, situation tipped over. And, but the main point of this highlights the fact that any in Greece, any in Italy, any in Cyprus, in Ireland even more so, and Spain, there was a precipitous increase, a considerable increase of private debt to GDP. Uh, and therefore, after the eruption of the global uh, financial crisis, then we started realizing and the resolution how private debt was linked to sovereign default. And here you see that basically summarizes, if you will, <coughs> summarizes, if you will, my argument uh, how private debt is linked to sovereign default. You see that there was particularly uh, in Europe there was a high percentage of government-assisted banks uh, in 2007-2009. Uh, 
So for example, if you go to Italy, basically the entire banking sector, uh, where you have the government assisted, uh, assisted banks as a fraction of the total banking assets, uh, was totally government assisted. If you go even into France, the majority of the banks, these are the failed banks as a fraction uh, of the banking assets, and this is the government assisted banks. And you see that basically throughout the European Union, Austria, even Belgium, uh, with the exception of Iceland, Ireland, Italy, if you go to Greece, it was 100%, you see basically uh, the government intervention and how the private debt was basically metastasized to the government assisted banks. And that basically makes my point that private debt and sovereign default are intimately connected, particularly in the case of uh, the European, uh, the European uh, countries. Uh, but even if you go, uh, the only exception, if you wish, is the United uh, Kingdom, but even the United States uh, that had, you know, uh, famously uh, none government assisted banking sector, you see that a big percent of the banks uh, were government assisted. So basically, the first point of what I want to say today is that private debt, particularly after the global financial crisis, is intimately uh, connected with sovereign default. And therefore, uh, the management of the crisis affects, affects the households and the real sector of uh, the economy. Now, uh, the literature is extensive on this sort of business. In fact, uh, you have that banking crisis helped to explain uh, private uh, sovereign default, uh, and uh, basically that is the Reinhardt and Rogoff argument that private debts or, uh, often become public debts after the crisis, as uh, basically the sovereign countries, uh, central banks, we see this with QE, try to underwrite private debts in order to smooth uh, the adverse effects uh, of any financial crisis. Uh, more clearly, and Viral has established that empirically, that's a very good, empi a very good empirical paper that's basically it's a compilation of stylized facts whereby the Eurozone countries transferred all the default risk from the financial sector to sovereigns. And in a way, is what you read in the newspapers uh, you are kicking the can down the road. The transfer occurred from the private sector to the sovereigns, but then the eventually uh, the, it was not resolved properly the way that that was done in the US primarily and uh, with Geithner, uh, the administration under Geithner, in, uh, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and to a lesser extent in, uh, here in the UK. And uh, then we have a very good uh, literature by Fretchens and Reith on the two-way uh, two causality between sovereign uh, risk and bank risk and how can this uh, be uh, resolved. So, point number two, uh, not only private debt has increased, but after the global financial crisis, private debt and sovereign debt are interrelated, intimately connected, they are affect and they are affected uh, by each other. That's point two of uh, the stylized fact that we commence uh, our inquiry. Now, <coughs> basically, uh, the, key, uh, the key argument of what we try to establish uh, with co-authors and myself is that private debt is linked to sovereign debt and sovereign default ultimately. Governments serve as intermediaries in private debt restructuring. And this is the political economy aspect, if you will, of the increasing private debt and uh, banking and the impending banking crisis. Even in the cases, and we have examples and they are tabulated very well in the Sturzenegger paper, even when the government does not explicitly offer government guarantees, uh, creditors hold it accountable. For example, uh, in Korea in 1998, after the East Asian crisis, the Korean government signed an agreement with foreign creditor banks on rescheduling short-term foreign debt of domestic institutions. 20 billion, hello, 24 billion of short-term foreign debt into long-term debt and 20 
billion of the new debt carried government guarantees. So that was Korea. Likewise, Indonesia again, uh, towards the end of the East Asian crisis, uh, uh, it made an agreement with 13 uh, creditor banks uh, uh, for scheduling private sector debt for new loans that had a clause of, of explicit government guarantees. Finally, before that, in fact, you can say the same thing about the Brady bond exercise altogether, Chile in 1983, uh, Exante uh, warned private debtors that there will be no guarantees, but exposed guarantees were extended. And that's in Diaz and Alessandro's uh, work. So, bottom line, uh, what we argue, that private debt eventually is linked to sovereign debt, and this transition for private, uh, transformation of private to public debt is intermediated by the government. And I say this in order to emphasize the importance of negotiation and debt uh, restructuring. And the second, if you will, point, uh, <coughs> and the second point uh, that I usually make uh, with respect to my work is that default ensures against adverse unforeseen contingencies. Why? And in fact, the literature in economics finally caught up with reality uh, after the global financial crisis since it started embedding financial frictions uh, into the mainstream uh, macroeconomic models in order to address consumption smoothening that is not possible if you have frictions and missing financial markets and the fact that endogenous default, default occurs in economic downturns. Finally, and this is the key thing uh, that has not been, had not been uh, fully compre comprehended by mainstream, highly aggregative uh, finance and macro models, is the existence of pecuniary externalities. In other words, that the economy does not reach efficient allocations. The economy, if you will, the ones who know kind of more uh, uh, classical micro, the first best, the first welfare theorem does not obtain. In other words, we have externalities, we have missing financial markets, therefore the invisible hand of the Scotchman does not arrive in the first best solutions. Thereby, since we do not arrive in the first best, because private borrowers cannot, do not have the instruments to internalize on uh, the effect of their decisions on equilibrium prices, then there is scope for regulation, there is scope for intervention. In general, more generally, there is scope for policy. So this is, if you will, the main standpoint that all of our work commences, uh, commences from. That private debt is linked to sovereign, and there is a transferring of private debt and intermediation from sovereign governments, therefore this is the political economy of the aspect of it, and second, because of frictions and externalities, <coughs> private borrowers, I'm sorry, do not internalize the effects uh, of their decisions on equilibrium prices. So, this is, if you will, the stylized fact of what I, of what I wanted to say, and hopefully why the concept of introducing in our way of thinking default, endogenous default, and underscoring inefficiencies and frictions in the economy may lead us to some useful analysis. Now, I will use, I could have used uh, the same kind of logic to dissect what happened in Spain or what happened uh, in Portugal, but since I had, you know, first-hand experience, it's one of these times that you feel that you are useful, but you are useful in kind of a bad situation, so you're not really happy about your usefulness, is in the case of the Greek crisis. So let me, first of all, because I know everybody reads the newspapers, uh, and I want to make a caveat before I start explaining my argument using as a proxy, as a puppet, the Greek crisis. I could use the same argument uh, for Portugal or for Latin America. The argument is quite more generic. Uh, the caveat I, I want to make is I, I will not act here as a moral philosopher, 
trying to prove to you how great Greeks are, they're not, or how bad they are. I don't know how bad they are. I will not play the moralistic game. I'll try to give you an objective economic finance analysis of what happened. So, if you will, I will not wear this punitive <coughs> hat of Dr. Schäuble that wants to educate the profligate kids of Southern Europe. I'll try to retreat and be a little bit more aloof and try to give you more of a reasonable economic argument. So, for the ones that they say that what has happened to Greece nowadays has borne fruits, I will dedicate the ones that they believe that the various policies of the creditors of the, of the Greek government have started bearing fruit, I dedicate the following IMF figure. That's you know, my present to the ones who believe that they have succeeded dealing with the Greek crisis. Here we have the biggest crisis that we know in the last whatever century or so, starting from the US Great De uh, Depression. Now, first of all, the source is not the Greek statistical office or a Greek political party. So don't worry about that. The source is Eurostat. So that's uh, legit. And uh, the analytics and the IMF staff calculations. You see here, if we take 1929, for example, for the uh, uh, US Great Depression, after three years, you had stabilization of the economy, and after four years, you started having a recovery of the economy. Likewise, if you see the Asian crisis of 1997, 1998, which was quite protracted and quite important, you see after 1997, T plus one and a half, you had stabilization <coughs> and mild recovery. Even the Eurozone crisis, which was much longer than any of the other crises, we never reached the bottom and the pit that the Greek crisis reached, which now compares, uh, arguably compares with the US depression, but then we also stagnated. So in the old times, there was a financial economist by the name of Al Hansen who talked about secular stagnation. Now, this part of the resolution of the crisis in Greece basically gives you this lesson. So, now, I hope that this diagram speaks for itself, and I don't think many people can argue that the Greek crisis, and actually I will try to escalate the level of the argument uh, that the Greek Euro, the Eurozone debt crisis is over, is far, from, uh, far from over. Uh, this diagram, I think, at least establishes the fact for Greece. But then, the next level of the argumentation is that, well, it is not the problem of the Eurozone, it is the problem of Greece. It's the moralistic argument, the pastoral argument. Now, with respect to this argument, I have another nice statistic, which, of course, doesn't establish causation, but is established correlation. This is the per capita GDP uh, in constant prices and purchasing power parity relative to EU average for five countries in 1999 and here 2012. Uh, Germany obviously was the richest country in the vicinity, it was 122% of the European average in 1999. And in 2012, so before the big catastrophe hit the South, because the big catastrophe happened 13-14. So I'm trying to tie my hand behind my back to be more lenient to the level of the disaster. You see that Germany did fairly well from 1999 to 2012, it's now it's 125. Spain, that was the average, despite of not being bailed out explicitly, but implicitly, from 100, the average is 95. Italy, that other country, from 111% of the EU average has uh, degraded to 95. And now if you go to Portugal and Greece, you see that both of these countries from 1999 to 2012 are sweating blood. They were 85% of the EU average and Portugal is uh, 75. Greece, at least 2012, from 81 was 75, now is even worse. Now, what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say with this transparency 
I'm trying to say with this transparency that is something more structural because if you see that date is not coincidental. 1999 is the date of the introduction of the euro in the European Union. So that basically points, even though it doesn't establish causation, because you may argue that uh, Italian, Spaniards, Portuguese, and Greeks, they have some genetic deficiency or something. They are not good in the economics. But I'm not trying to establish causation, but I'm trying to alert you that what happened in Greece or in Portugal is something deeper and is more structural and pertains to the entire southern or the periphery countries of the European Union. In fact, if you go to the literature of the 80s, at the time I was in the US, I was an undergrad in the 80s, if you read the speeches of seemingly politically diverse leaders, François Mitterrand, uh, Thatcher, or Helmut Kohl, you will see all were pointing the same direction, that the north-south gap, had you not closed it, it will re-emerge and come back and haunt the entire European Union. In fact, people with different political proclivities, they were saying exactly the same thing, that the north-south divide, if it doesn't close, it will reappear with viciousness. And I think that diagram makes the point quite explicit. And Euro was not the magic, the silver bullet that will solve everything, because the gap between the North and the South was big and became even bigger. So, and actually I have another transparency to see the dynamics, the dynamics of uh, the per capita GDP uh, gap of Italy, Greece, Spain, and Portugal vis-a-vis -vis the uh, EU average. Again, is the same, is the same uh, story. And that I go back to 1950. I go back to 1950, and you see, basically, after 19, uh, uh, 1999, you see things are getting worse and worse, and there is a downward slope. It's not. I should have done this diagram a little bit better, but basically is exactly the same message that the previous figure communicates. So that's point number three. Point number three is that the Greek problem that I will talk about from now on is kind of a case study, but it's not a weird, unique case study, but more or less a representative agent from the entire South. Now, I hope I have convinced you something is going on and something should uh, happen. Uh, something should happen to these uh, countries. And there, now I will draw heavily, or I'll make a summary of the work we have done with the usual suspects, Charles, uh, Yudara, and myself on uh, debt, recovery rates, and the Greek dilemma. There is this issue, there is this issue that uh, uh, basically whether or not Greek debt is mm -hmm. sustainable. To some extent, this issue, uh, this issue uh, was a familiar issue for all the southern countries. And there is someone in this room who since 2011, <laughs> about you, was saying that this Greek debt was not sustainable. Uh, something had to be done. And in fact, in Greece, uh, there was a major restructuring of debt that occurred in 2012 and in effect resulted uh, in a transfer from the private creditors of Greece, uh, of private creditors to Greece, of around 100 billion. So in present value terms, and that resulted in haircuts in the vicinity of 60%. In fact, is the largest haircut ever. However, the date is 2012. The Eurozone crisis started 2010. So basically, one can argue that this PSI that was supposed, that was supposed uh, to resolve the Greek crisis, it was in effect, de facto, the first bail-in in the European Union. In what way? It was the first bail-in. It was not the Cypriot one because and actually, we have now evidence from minutes from the IMF and the European conversations 
that the French and the foreign banks, the core banks, transferred all of their debts, all of their bond holdings to the Greek banks and the pension, to the Greek pension system, and then uh, the PSI, the private sector involvement occurred. Therefore, you screw Greece. And therefore, the last lever of potential growth, increase of the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio was dismantled, which is credit policy, because you have lost fiscal policy because de facto you are not healthy. If not bankrupt, you are not healthy. You don't have the funds to increase, to do public investments. Monetary policy is not controlled, is controlled by the European Central Bank. And the only remaining lever you had was the credit policy. And after the PSI, you lost the banking sector. So in fact, some of us had said in 2012, the game was lost completely. And now, with the IMF figure, I think we are right. In any case, our argument is whether, uh, whether there is a policy of restructuring of Greek debt that not on moralistic terms, uh, this, all of this, when I listened to politicians, I saw them talking seriously with a straight face. We are all partners. We have to show solidarity and all that. And then the day after, they were imposing more and more austerity. No, I'm not following the road of the collaboration of the creditors to the profligate Spaniards or Portuguese. I say whether I can establish a reasonable economic argument where debt restructuring uh, can benefit both the creditors and the debtors. Because remember, the world that I have in mind is a world, is a world, and I will, this issue will recover, because that's the main theorem, if you will, of my entire work, because you have missing financial markets, and you, have, you have frictions, default occurs, you cannot get rid of default, therefore if default and bankruptcy occurs, you have choices, how to deal with the defaulted people. And in fact, history, economic history, has various shades of default de behavior. You have what happened in Saudi Arabia. When, they default, when you default, they cut your hand, your head, they do things to you. You have uh, Europe, where that's a more intermediate kind of a regime when you default. And then you have the United States. When you default, you be elected president. They con you are congratulated. So, the question is, in the presence of frictions and missing financial markets, what is the optimal default, uh, what is the optimal default rate? And whether we can think of a way that a restructuring of the Greek debt will be beneficial to both creditors and, uh, creditors and debtors. And basically, all what we are, uh, the way we should start seeing about debt restructuring it's not like debt forgiveness. We should be thinking as some sort of macroprudential regulation. It's another policy tool. It's a factor of life that one can be used to welfare improve both the debtors and the creditors. And uh, finally, since when you go to these uh, institutions, to policymakers, to the IMF, to these world powerful, all powerful institutions, you need to be quantitative about it. They don't buy words. You have to have numbers. So that's what I'm trying to do. And by the way, uh, I have to mention, and that I read, quote unquote, that what I am saying, four years ago, nobody would ever, except Clemens, nobody would agree with me, except Oren would agree with me. In fact, he was harsher than I was. Clemens would agree with me. Now I read from uh, a paper by Maury Opsfeld and Paul Thompson, who was the first educator or punisher of Greece as the head of Troika, and I have negotiated with him in 2012, that says uh, he, they published the IMF uh, in austerity uh, with respect of case, and they explicitly say, quote and quote, and quote, Greece's debt is highly unsustainable, and no amount of structural reforms will make it sustainable again without significant debt relief. That's IMF. It is not some lunatic economist or financial economist who believes in. No, that's Mori Offset. Similarly, no amount of debt relief will allow Greece to return to robust growth 
without reforms. But since, and that's the catch, this is the politics of the negotiation, since the higher the primary surplus that Greece maintains, the lower the amount of debt relief to ensure debt sustainability, the question is how to distribute the burden between Greece and the European partners. I think that summarizes the entire debate. And in fact, if you go back to the First World War, that's exactly what Keynes was trying to do with the Americans. It was the same kind of debate has reappeared again. We screwed up then. Let's hope we will not screw up now. Now, the model that we have is a decentralized, uh, is a decentralized two-country uh, real business cycle model. So I'm using the mickier than, ma the, the mickier than mouse model that one can possibly use. The, out of the shelf, I'm taking a model that is totally conservative, totally mainstream, and try to see how far I can go. So I tie my hands, both of my hands, behind my back. And I introduce only two frictions. Incomplete markets, so they are frictions. So we are not living in an ideal, rosy world. And default. And then we do the standard uh, macroeconomic uh, financial thing. We do total factor productivity shocks. Then it turns out, it turns out that a policy of immediate leniency in other words, restructuring, followed by a tough government budget constraint is the optimal policy as compared to the procyclical renegotiation terms benefit that benefits the creditor to the detriment of the debtor. So what is happening now till you execute the country completely? Of course, the creditors get whatever surplus value exists in Greece, but sooner or later, Greece or any other country will fall flat on its belly and the creditor will not be able to reap any other benefit. Likewise, the counter-cyclical debt restructuring, basically you burn the house and no questions are asked. It is detrimental to the creditor and very beneficial to the borrower. Why? Because you burn the house and no questions are asked. And consequently, the intermediate, the intermediate uh, policy benefits both uh, by uh, be uh, benefits both creditors and borrowers by reducing aggregate volatility of consumption and smoothing what I originally said consumption of both countries. However, the key here, and that's the question that I ask all the time, is this: that followed by harsher repayment terms. In other words, followed by a harsh by a hard budget constraint. If you're lenient, they congratulate you, they help you, and then you start playing again the same game that all of the South European countries played uh, from 2001 to 2008, then basically my argument is no longer valid. We take the view, uh, we take the view that default is synonymous with restructuring existing debt and argue that immediate restructuring that minimizes and reduces the net present value of existing debt obligations, uh, benefits, and the borrowing country, as well as uh, the credit countries, both in the medium as well as, as, well as the long term. Uh, we have a model with trade, so we take a decentralized economy, uh, whereby we define that Greece is the debtor nation, and let's say Germany is the main creditor nation, and that's in fact a factual assumption. And uh, in this model, Greeks uh, can issue can issue both uh, secured as well as unsecured debt. Therefore, by doing by doing this, basically, uh, basically, I allow for endogenous. Uh, default in equilibrium, and then I also allow the possibility, uh, the possibility of renegotiating on unsecured debt when and if default occurs. Finally, the expectations of creditors, since the model is a rational expectations model, there is nothing behavior in this model is out of a textbook model, determine whether a good 
default free or uh, default free or a renegotiation steady state equilibrium prevails. And now, basically, the key analytical, the key analytical uh, novelty uh, of the model is that basically uh, we allow that basically uh, we allow uh, as if you wish a credit conditions variable that is state contingent. Now let us motivate this variable omega, which basically captures the idea of what happens to you when you default. We motivate uh, as basically a macro variable that governs the effort uh, and the cost of renegotiating debt. In other words, the Greek debtor households decide how much debt to renegotiate, taking this as fixed. So this is, if you will, the default penalty. Moreover, the creditors agree to reduce uh, the net present value of debt uh, by a fraction that can be recovered. Finally, uh, uh, the policy analysis focuses uh, around uh, the ultimate recovery rate. And the considerations that we have in order to define the state contingent default penalty is that moral hazard matters. So in other words, the American approach of congratulating you when you default is not that great because you may get stuck with people who default all the time for many, many terms. Claim two, renegotiation costs are contingent on aggregate default rates. So the more you default or the more your economy this is default, the lower the cost will be and the renegotiation is contingent on private sector financial, uh, financial uh, vulnerability. And all in all, in order to match the data, because this analysis is to match the data, omega is a pro-cyclical macro variable that governs the interpretation of economic data in the process of renegotiation. So this is, think of it, and this is the capital, the debt to GDP ratio. Think of this as a procyclical default penalty that governs uh, my entire uh, economic uh, the, the evolution of my economy. Then, after we do these things, what we do? We take, I won't bother you now, it's too late, it's week nine, with all of these things. We just take out of the literature and the literature is extensive, <coughs> source values and model values of uh, our model. And we use all the mainstream top end, high end, second order approximations to calibrate the data. Then we have the parameters that uh, we assume that are realistic, credible, even Charles agrees with them, that he's very pedantic with numbers, and here it is the restructuring policies. That's the heart of our argument. We have K, which is the recovery rate. So basically, forget it's technical, these are all, uh, all of these uh, autoregressive uh, terms you don't need uh, to think, but let me describe to you what exactly is happening. Here basically is the recovery rate, uh, and it's governed by this process. Now, if I have an acyclical, if you wish, a state independent, a time independent restructuring policy, then basically whatever you do in whatever part of the business cycle you are, you will be punished the same way. They will be, you will be restructured and recovered the same way. The procyclical way, which if you will, the creditor's way, that the more you default, the more you'll be punished in order to, be, to behave the day after. So in that case, these parameters, rho k, which are the regressive, uh, the rho k and the ukt, these are basically the regressive uh, parameters for the total factor productivity shock. And this, all what it says, that k, which is the recovery rate, what they will extract from you in the case of default, increases the more you default. But now if you are Greek, if you are the Tsipras government, for example, they wanted to burn the house once again, you want the counter-cyclical 
kind of restructuring policy. In other words, the more you default, the more you should be congratulated. Uh, this is the counter-cyclical policy. And finally, this is the intermediate policy that I talked in the beginning, whereby initially you are being treated in a very lenient way because the UK is positive, and subsequently, subsequently you are uh, being treated much more harshly. In other words, we try to replicate, in effect, what is behind our mind is what the IMF usually does in countries where that they control their uh, monetary policy. You devalue, you allow countries to get out, to export, and at the same time, you do reforms and you impose hard budget constraints. So this is the intermediate kind of restructuring policy. I restructure and then I oblige you in a time consistent way to follow a hard budget constraint. And the question is, what are the welfare implications for the creditor and the borrower of these four policies? If you talked to a Greek, they say, we love this. Obviously, because that they will be better off. If you talk to a creditor, he says, I love this, because they think that this way they will recover what they are owed. And if you talk, and this is the benchmark case that is insensitive to whatever happens. Now, with real data, what does our calibration give us? That the Pareto optimal, it improves both the creditor as well as the borrower, the intermediate uh, policy. Why? Because in the presence of incomplete markets, in the presence of default and production, you don't want basically to cut both hands of uh, the person that owes to you because you will have no more hands to work and produce for you. And this has nothing to do with morality. It's a pure economics argument with capital accumulation investment within the mainstream economic model. You first default, restructure, then you follow a hard budget constraint and everybody is better off. You see here, for example, in the pro-cyclical thing, as compared uh, to the cyclical, obviously the creditors benefit, uh, the debtor countries uh, are hurt substantially. Likewise, likewise in the counter-cyclical, the borrowers are benefiting non-trivially because these are in the billions, so you may see many uh, decimal points, but these are billions, so it's real money because after all Greece's GDP is 180 billions and this is the counter-cyclical and the creditors are being hurt. As opposed to the intermediate, this is in fact a little bit, it improves if I had the fifth decimal and definitely the creditors can get uh, their money back. And if you do the impulse response functions, you see all the nice diagrams and you compare and contrast, the red line is the intermediate uh, restructuring policy, the green line is the procyclical, and the purple line is uh, the countercyclical. You see the first kind of uh, thing that the volatility of consumption that drives welfare is being reduced. So basically by having the intermediate policy, you have lower, uh, lower volatility of consumption. And the German welfare, you see basically if you, ag if you integrate over these areas that uh, the, uh, you see that uh, the intermediate default penalty improves all of them. The return of capital, you see again, lower volatility with the intermediate. Uh, the wage decrease, uh, you see a lower collapse of the effective demand because what happened in Greece and what happened uh, in Portugal is the effective demand, in fact, <coughs> I, I think I've shown this uh, figure, the effective demand after the bailout and the debt restructuring collapsed in all of the southern uh, countries. You see the capital uh, stock depreciates much less, in other words, lower corporate bankruptcies uh, in, uh, uh, with the intermediate restructuring and likewise uh, with the pro-cyclical, in fact, that's what has killed the economies of Southern Europe, 
that if you follow procyclical restructuring policies, then you have a precipitous collapse of production. So you have both a negative demand shock and a negative supply shock. In other words, from both aspects of the market, you hit the denominator of your economy. Yes, you do things by being punitive on the numerator of your debt, but at the same time, you disproportionately, you decrease the denominator. And eventually, as we say in calculus, you will reach the L'Hopital's rule, zero over zero, and this undefined. <coughs> then these are the interest rates. I don't want to say anything about the interest rates. Uh, and I want to say about the default rates that <coughs> basically with the intermediate, you have lower default rates. So basically, the key thing, the key thing that I emphasize is that because we have lower default rates, lower volatility of consumption, therefore better consumption smoothing, and lower decrease of the supply because the capital stock does not drop as precipitously as it would otherwise drop, the intermediate, the intermediate uh, debt restructuring policy is optimal for both the creditor's point of view and the debtor's point of view. And that, what I just mentioned, is not a political economy statement, it's a purely competitive mainstream model with only two frictions. Uninsured risks, number one, there is some market frictions, there is incomplete market, and you allow that there is also unsecured debt. Of course, the assumption is that the assumption is that you will follow after the initial forgiving policy, uh, harsh repayment conditions and a hard budget constraint. So that's part two uh, of the talk. Now, part three of the talk will be a new paper, which now I hope that you're sufficiently tired not to pick the mistakes because the first time I present this, so I've confused you. Yes. 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 For Greece. Greece Correct. It's not, it's not very optimal. Well, the true, if I had another point here, it is, uh, that's better. It's plus. So by approximation, it's the same. I compare, what I compare with the, my benchmark case is the acyclical. Obviously, the president wants to bankrupt on all of his and never to pay anybody back, obviously. I mean, that, but my benchmark that I play my game is with respect to the acyclical one. And with respect to the acyclical, obviously the Germans improve and uh, the Greeks improve. And the Greeks improve, uh, marginally. So the key point is something that might be digestible by the creditors that have the bargaining power in their pocket. In fact, it would be better for them rather any other thing. So that's basically the main, uh, the main point, because these things are with real data, so even though it seems they are small, but these are millions, these are hundreds of millions of uh, euros. Now, the next bit of my argument uh, will be, because somebody might say, in fact, that's what they tell me whenever I present, they tell me two things, by the way. Uh, they tell me two things whenever I present this. That's why we wrote the second paper. Okay, there is a third reason, and I will briefly touch upon. They tell me, but you have a problem. Uh, we did a PSI. PSI happened in Greece. It happened in 2012. So we did exactly what you suggested. Still, the Greek economy has not recovered. And number two, uh, they tell you uh, Greeks, uh, Greeks uh, are totally profligate. Uh, you can, they cannot credibly commit to any plan. And that's how we started writing the second paper. And there is a third, I'll talk about the third reason why we started writing this paper. With me, that's a mistake here. She's no longer here. She's in the University of Nevada. Uh, she, she has left. She's a game theorist. Now, IMF, again, not us, is the IMF who says, and in my opinion, correctly so, debt restructuring has often been 
too little and too late. And that's IMF, and that's exactly what happened in Greece in the sense that haircuts uh, suboptimally, they were suboptimally low, late, because of private borrowing. In other words, what happened with the PSI, because all the debt was transferred to the Greek banks, Greek banks, after the PSI, basically, they couldn't extend any more loans, they were totally liquidity drained, and then they had to be recapitalized. How they were recapitalized? They were recapitalized by borrowing from the European stability mechanism. Therefore, instead of lowering the debt to GDP ratio, they increased it. In fact, 15 years down the line, I believe, 20 years down the line, the Greek PSI of 2012 will be a great example of bad and failed debt restructuring. It will be one of the best examples of a failed uh, debt restructuring. Had it happened in 2010, to the same extent, maybe, you cannot do comparative statics with these things, maybe it would have worked. Second, we are trying now, because when you do restructuring, <coughs> basically because contracts are incomplete, uh, you try, uh, because con uh, contracts are incomplete, uh, we try to introduce uh, basically contracts that facilitate debt restructuring. In other words, you know, to facilitate debt restructuring, you have to increase the bargaining power of the borrower. Only if the borrower has better bargaining power, then in the world of incomplete contracts, you can have a more efficient debt restructuring. And what we argue, uh, that such measures of having higher bargaining power of the borrowers can damage private agents' ability to borrow. In other words, it was the criticism that was staged to the latest administration of Greece that says, okay, we do whatever we want. If we default on our obligations, then the whole euro will be shattered. Obviously, that was not the case because you don't play chicken if you one person has a BMW uh, which is fortified and the other person is barefoot because you know what happens. You play chicken in game theory. The main assumption is that you have relatively similar powers, and that was, and second, the market disciplined you by not extending you any more credit, by increasing default risks, credit risks, and therefore you are being kept out of the market. So instead, what we argue, again, within a mainstream macroeconomic model, the key thing that basically from the back door increases the borrower's bargaining power is to subsidize capital uh, investment in order to mitigate both problems. Because if you saw the impact response functions of before, where the heart of the problem is that default impairs the productive base and the productive ability of your economy. Now, uh, borrowing is private. Now, why? I'll start talking about renegotiation and bargaining, because as I said an hour ago, Borrowing is private, whereas debt crisis resolution is conducted by governments. And that was the case across all Europe. It is not corporate restructuring where corporations do the negotiations. Governments do the negotiation, and if you follow every Eurogroup, that's all what was happening. Uh, and the EU banking system was deeply interconnected, and therefore, uh, inevitably, uh, the negotiations and the bargaining should happen at a European-wide uh, European uh, level. So the model now we have in mind is one, is one that the government borrows <coughs> and the private, uh, uh, the government bargains and the private agents uh, borrow and the question is, what should the optimal haircut be as a result of this bargaining that happens at the governmental level? And the outcome of this is, again, it should be high in recessions, which is compatible with what I had argued in the previous uh, work. So if government borrows, uh, basically, you choose borrowing to manipulate the outcome of renegotiation. However, if the households borrow, they do not internalize this uh, effect. So what I'm saying here, and that's critical, the households, they do not internalize the externality of default. Whereas the governments, when you do 
bargaining renegotiations, they do internalize, and if they are benevolent social planners, they can impose better conditions for debt restructuring. And governments could impose uh, subsidies or taxes to alter uh, household choices. In other words, the governments can create a productive basis to sustain, if you will, the autarkic state if you default and if you are shut out of the markets. So if you have a, uh, if you have a productive base, if you have a high capital accumulation, then you are in a better position to negotiate with your creditors. In fact, that was why the IMF was very annoyed with the European creditors, because they waited for Greece to be totally on the floor, and then they did the debt restructuring. In 2010 or 2009, there was some remaining productive capability in Greece. And that's why now if you see <coughs> the European partners, they're much more afraid with Italy. Because Italy still has, not intact, it is impaired, but it's not heavily impaired, it's productive basis. And that's why they are not worried any longer whatever Greece does. It's not because it's a small country, because basically it cannot do anything. It's too late to do anything in effect as opposed to Italy and to France, that's a different ball game. And that's why everybody is afraid what's going to happen in a couple of months in France. We are not helping for something good to happen, but everybody is afraid. Now, <coughs> the economic environment that we are dealing with, uh, we have again two countries. We have a more complicated model since we allow for negotiation. Uh, we have the borrower and uh, the creditor the home country borrows, uh, the output uh, is standard DSG model, you consume and you invest as capital. Firms are endowed with a productive, uh, with a productive uh, technology uh, and we have two states of nature, uh, the good state of nature, the high or the low, and firms can supplement uh, the states of nature if they can borrow uh, if they can borrow and if they have access in the capital markets uh, and they can finance trade and therefore the productivity will be increased with the amount they will borrow. And now the access to intra-period capital markets is predicated on households having the ability to access the capital markets. So that's why it is important if you default not to be thrown out of the capital markets because there is this little z term, which is basically the gains from accessing and borrowing in international capital markets. So, more or less, that's what the model is. You don't need to know anything else. That is basically t equals zero, where households choose their consumption, their borrowing and their capital investments. And then, after you know whether the high or the low state of nature has occurred, because you have borrowed, then you decide whether you repay fully and life is okay, or you decide whether you default fully and then you are ousted from the capital markets in t equals one and t equals two. And then there is the intermediate state where you renegotiate and then firms choose again consumption, borrowing and capital investments and they produce. So basically these are the three uh, alternative resolutions of uncertainty given that the high or the low uh, state has occurred. Now, we don't need to do this at this point in time. The only thing I have to say here that the foreign country, I consider that is, uh, we say in economics and finance, as risk neutral. In other words, fully ensures the boring country. In other words, to make our lives easy and the calculations easy, we allow uh, for the foreign household to ensure uh, the borrowing uh, agent. Now, <clears throat> what do we do here? Uh, we have a Nash bargaining problem where basically we compare uh, the welfare uh, of the home country when you restructure the debt and we subtract the welfare when you're autarkic. The same thing we do for the uh, foreign country we maximize the product in order to find the optimal, uh, the optimal default rate given the bargaining power of the home country. For example, if theta equals one, 
that means Greece can dictate its own optimal repayment and default rate. If theta is zero, that means Greece doesn't have any power whatsoever. So endogenously, given the bargaining power of the borrower and one minus the bargaining power of the creditor, we obtain the optimal uh, default rate in equilibrium. So theta is a choice value? No. Theta is the contract term. That's, we have trivialized. What is a choice variable is when given theta, you bargain and you derive the default rate. And then after we do that, then we go and we do calibration and we do examples to see what is the effect of the negotiating power of the country. This a calculation that Varoufakis should have done and never did. And here we have done now, what's the default rate? We have basically the decentralized equilibrium with bargaining versus the optimal haircut. We have the welfare of the home country. Uh, and you see here there is an optimal default level. So there is an optimal restructuring, bargaining restructuring uh, solution that comes out of the bargaining, how to restructure their debt. Here you have uh, the marginal utilities, but the key point is that this is non-monotonic. And that's the important thing. Why this is the important thing? Uh, the important thing here is that if you have a very low default rate, then even the boring country runs the risk to be ousted from the market and not to invest optimally. And if you have, uh, sorry, if you have a high, uh, a low default, and if you have a very high default rate, you are ousted. And if you have a very low, if you have a very low default rate, you may leave unused many investment opportunities. Therefore, the optimal default rate is somewhere in the middle. And this is consistent with the old intuition of uh, Shapley and Shub Shubik and Wilson, in fact, and Dubey and Jonakopoulos, whereby they said in the presence of a complete market, when default is an insurance mechanism, it cannot be very, very lenient, because if it is lenient, you lose equilibrium, and if it's very harsh, then you kill the risk-taking behavior. So by continuity, the optimal default rate is somewhere in the middle, uh, in the middle, given the bargaining power of the country. Now, what did I do here? Okay. Now, the literature, <coughs> basically to summarize the literature on this issue, and that's where we differ. If you see the U paper, basically it talks about boring and the bargain, bargaining by the government. It says that if the bargaining power increases, then you have to increase the haircut in recessions, and that includes the welfare. This is the planner solution, where you internalize the externality. However, if you have a competitive economy where you decentralize the externality, the higher theta, the higher bargaining power, basically precipitates in households being ousted from the capital markets, and therefore they cannot borrow, therefore they cannot produce, because they do not internalize the externality. This is basically our contribution, that we try <coughs> what others have done using the central planner. We try to do it using uh, a decentralized model. And then basically we do further simulations where we compare, where we compare again the decentralized equilibrium and the bargaining power. Here, as the bargaining power increases, you see, as the bargaining power of Greece increases, you see the welfare increases. However, what's the interesting thing? There is a collapse. There is a discontinuity. After a point, the creditors rationally expect that you are going to default. Therefore, they do not lend you anything. And then you become North Korea. So that's the key thing is that there is monotonic. The more, the greater the bargaining power you have, the more uh, the higher default you can ascertain, the higher borrowing you can ascertain up to a point before you are ousted from the markets, and this is continuity. And here, basically, this figure rationalizes why the creditor nations, they try to delay, they try to delay uh, debt restructuring in the case of Greece. Instead of doing it 2010, 
when the problem emerged, they, where the bargaining power was stronger, they tried to weaken the bargaining power of the country as time passed on. So this is, it was totally rational what the creditors did, and actually it's also understandable why the IMF officials were crossed at the fact uh, that the Europeans had offloaded the government bond borrowings uh, to the Greek banks. Once again, you see here uh, the decentralized equilibrium and the centralized, and you see here the point that U makes. Okay, the differences are small, but they are discernible. You have the blue line is the, the centralized, so the social planner, and the red line is the decentralized, and obviously the central planner, uh, who internalized the externality, uh, arrives at a better arrives at a better uh, welfare effect. Now, since I see that the decentralized equilibrium cannot internalize the externality, the question is, does the government have any other tool to improve its bargaining power? Because improving bargaining power doesn't happen by grandstanding in Eurozone, in Eurozone meetings. You have to be more realistic <laughs> and uh, more coherent in your action. And now, what we have come up with is if you take the household budget constraint, we take tax and capital investments and making transfers. So basically, this is the capital investment, uh, the taxes on uh, investment, and then the transfer as capital subsidies uh, to the households. So basically, we have a balanced budget transfer, or if you will, okay, now I know my co-authors do not allow me to say this, uh, and they are right, uh, but with a little bit of imagination, if I take a poetic liberty, basically what I say here, yes, I should have a balanced budget, but I will allow the cyclical deficit to increase. So I will allow the deficit, uh, the cyclical deficit for public investments, for capital investments to increase, whereas I will control the overall deficit and I will minimizing the structural deficit. Translation, I should be limiting the public sector's profligacy and I will be transferring resources to capital and public investments. If I do that, then basically using now, uh, remember if the transfers are zero is here, when I have the optimal transfers, basically the moral of the story is I can more or less replicate more or less replicate the social planner's position. So by doing these transfers uh, from taxes uh, to capital investments, then basically I can replicate the social planner's investment without necessarily, with no apparent reason, changing the parameter theta. So that's basically the optimal capital subsidy. And now I can conclude by saying three things. First, private borrowing and sovereign debt restructuring make debt levels and capital investments suboptimal. And that was the case in two th of the PSI 2012 that happened in Greece. Measures that facilitate, the question is, uh, should measures that facilitate uh, sovereign debt restructuring be changed? Uh, and the answer to this this should be approached with caution because the optimal debt restructuring is neither you burn the house and no questions asked, nor you are punitive uh, for pedagogical reasons. And how can I replicate uh, when private borrowing is important, how can I replicate the centralized planner's solution? Our kind of uh, suggestion is uh, by doing structural reforms that target uh, the increase and the stimulation of capital investments. So that's my statement. Debt restructuring is good. You don't need to be moralistic about it. It has economic, some economic arguments. It should happen. Uh, it should happen given some sort of optimal consideration that is an outcome of a bargaining uh, of a bargaining uh, game between creditors and debtors in order to implement the optimal uh, 
default level in the economy given the frictions that exist. And that is important to know that is happening because private debt is uh, occurs in a decentralized me uh, measure, but the default is intermediated by the governments. And I rest my case. Questions, comments, disagreements, agreements. Very few people agreed in the past. Now it's getting better. To well, main. Well, other than the stock. So yeah. is that built into the software somehow? The fact that they're expedited to go beyond both of them? There is. Okay, in the first model, why do the why do the creditors want to lend to Greece <laughs> or to the South for that matter? <laughs> Can't they do it somewhere else? <laughs> You're absolutely right. We have a term but it's exogenous. We have net foreign investments, but this exogenous. So there is something to be added along this dimension. You're right. In fact, maybe you were the referee. <laughs> the referee pointed this out. I convince you. Or it's benign negligence. <laughs> Below. No, it's monetary union. That's why it was a real business cycle model. I didn't play around with different currencies, nothing. I tied all of my hands. The first model was totally out of the book. In the monetary union, the argument would be that internal devaluation that doesn't happen is not as effective as no. external devaluation? Or no. If you talk about monetary union, how would you explain that? No, no. They, okay. The, Okay, we don't have internal. The problem with internal devaluation is that in this model I cannot do internal devaluation because this model is too good for the real effects of internal devaluation. In the internal devaluation, there are frictions in, el uh, elastic, in elastic imports, uh, in elastic cost of production. So basically, you twist relative prices against the borrower big time. Translation, you exacerbate the collapse of the denominator. Because internal devaluation works when I lower the wages, I lower the commodity prices. So with the Walras law. But what happened in Greece, you lower wages, you lower pensions, pensioners were losing weight, prices were remaining the same. So, and this is that's a, yet another paper, which for the entire South, for Greece, is more pronounced, is that the main problem, structural problem, that exists in Southern Europe is oligopolistic effects in the product markets, the labor markets, and institutional inefficiencies that slow down foreign direct investments and investments in general. That's is not included here. That's why I didn't talk because my model is a real business cycle model. I don't have room for this sort of stuff. Yeah, good question. You're right. Yes? So the, the solution, I think, is the liberalization of the, of the market, I think, to be, to be more competitive. Oh, if, we have, if, if we can focus <coughs> on the regional world, is that true or not? Because no, it's not. It's not. I talked about debt restructuring. Ultimately, if I impose euthanasia on pensioners, I will resolve the pension problem of Greece. And if I eliminate civil servants, if I do the Deng Xiaoping solution with a single child policy, of course. The question is, given the friction in the short run, can I smooth the consumption of the people? And all what I am arguing, debt restructuring and a hard budget constraint can do the trick. And if you cannot play around with the bargaining power because you are a small player, you can shift resources to capital investment. And if you want me to exacerbate 
to escalate my argument, you can shift, but this is not legal within the European Union, to shift resources towards internationally traded goods and services. Which is not allowed because that's uh, against, the against the competition law of the European Union. Yes, these are, uh, these, are, uh, these are the standard, no, the price are high. This is the standard oligopolistic frictions that exist uh, in the Greek economy. There's oligopolistic effects. This, for sure, but this cannot solve the whole thing. Because, okay, now I can say this. I, cannot, I, I didn't say this in Greece the last week, but now I can say this here. You first need the Roosevelt deal, the new deal, then you need Thatcher. First you go, or Reagan, whatever side of the Atlantic you are. First you need the New Deal. It's a demand problem now. And then, after you push the car away from the mud, then let's start talking about these sort of things. Now we have a more fundamental problem in this country. Not only in Greece, in Portugal it's the same problem, by the way. It's not as pronounced as it is in Greece. In Greece it's very big. 